we been looking at the last few days? I feel like we've had this epic road trip, ferry trip around Scotland to see sites at risk. Several folks have asked me on this trip, so what does Scotland have to do with the U.S. and the National Park Service? The fact is uh, you're losing your coastlines rapidly and so are we. So it's a similar, uh, similar problem. Um, and a lot of it has really resonated with sites we have in Florida. Actually, the whole coast, the coastal sites all the way around the states that are eroding out of similar sand dune structures. <laughs> There's a lot going on. I think I was struck with not only the number of sites that we've seen, the extent of your uh, occupations, the length of time um, is just amazing. But all of the complexity and the potential information that lies behind them. Um, so we've been on Sandy for the past couple of days, looking at various coastal heritage sites. The island shape is like a dragon and, 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 and on each, how do you say, the, <laughs> on each end of the dragon there are some exposed archaeological features. It's a major part of this island's heritage, the archaeology. And certainly there are sites here which are unique in the British Isle. This is the first time I've visited Sandy and it didn't take long to realise that many of the coastal heritage sites are really susceptible to things like coastal erosion. Yes, yes, it's a big problem here because Sandy is really low-lying. So every winter we get huge tides and huge uh, winds. Especially on this island, the winter storms can be so horrific. Coastal erosion is an issue that's exacerbated by climate change, um, sea level rise, uh, changes in patterns of storms and intensity of storms. Hearing from the community members and people working on the islands about the way the coastline has been retreating in certain places over the last few years and how they are in their own lifetime seeing more climatic events, more serious events, more serious storms. Yeah, I've got an old, an old broch, 100 yards from the, the main farmhouse maybe. It's been a substantial building at one time, but it's disappearing. And I live near the Scar boat burial one, so I keep an eye on that. And there's more of that being exposed. Yeah, well, there's a big storm. And I get down to the beach to see what like the wall was, in case it was undermined, and I found all the stones sticking up out of the beach. So I went in and got Ruth, my wife, to come and have a look. This particular one here at Moor is a case in point. And uh, one of these days, there will be a major storm force 10 and 12 and it will wash the whole thing away. I've experienced a whole range of emotions from, um, oh my gosh, we can't save that, um, to how can we save that. So I think this experience of, of meeting with communities, visiting sites has really raised my appreciation for, for the seriousness of the issue. If we do take um, a, a do nothing approach, then we're potentially facing sort of fairly fairly extreme loss. If it's all going to be lost it would be a shame that you couldn't you couldn't find it and store it away somewhere that it's safe for future generations to see. I think it's really important that these sites that are susceptible to coastal erosion and sea level rise are re recorded appropriately. Then start analysing what is possible here. Um, I think there must be a range of um, options for uh, the site. Rescue them or record them or excavate them for future generations and yeah, educate the kids. And... In an ideal world we'd like them to be excavated wouldn't we? Everybody would. Yes, well the one at Moor that we've been working on. We had to relocate it because it was getting washed away. Well, if it's something worth rescuing, they should rescue them, but they have no minion. Maybe try and protect them, I don't know. That's maybe on some of these sites as much as we can do, is to, to buy some time um, through, through coastal defences. I think using of sandbags and, and community monitoring is a really good way of, of, of buying a bit of time and thinking about what the approaches might need to be to, as that heritage um, as the artefacts and the archaeology within those sites are exposed. To build walls around many of the sites would be far too expensive and not possible. And, and again, coastal defences have a lot of their own problems and, and have to be thought about on a site-by-site on a -site basis. Well, they should be doing something, but I mean, the amount of this, it would be, it wouldn't be able to protect them all, so you'd need to just pick on a 
most important ones and try and rescue them. It needs to be prioritised to, to see what the most important ones are. One of the big questions that we face uh, you know, in Florida and, and also here in Scotland is how do we prioritise sites? How do we, in the face of certain loss of uh, a substantial amount of coastal heritage, how do we, how do we decide which sites to save, uh, which sites to protect, which sites to excavate, and which sites to just uh, walk away from? And one of the other things that I think is also extremely important that I've been trying to fit into our larger model is saving a diversity of sites. I think we should prioritise sites by the ones we can actually see being eroded year by year, even month by month. I really see it as an iterative process of trying to work through which sites are most at risk, why are they most at risk, what is the greatest value, and then working with those pieces to figure out the best next set of steps going forward. That said, uh, we have to figure out some, some tough ways to make choices, uh, to either focus on, on a few sites and get a lot of information, or maybe to focus on a lot of sites, get a little information. The big thing that we've talked about, though, is significance. Yeah, it's been haunting me a bit, this question of significance. The values of sites have three major components. One is the intrinsic values. I think that you look at, you know, rarity, um, you know, how many sites like that do you have recorded. In terms of gaining the knowledge and exploring, getting a sense of the scope of the sites and perhaps what may be there, the potential that they have, is really important in terms of determining what sort of action people might want to take. So what do we do with the sites that for which we don't yet have the information, we don't know how important they are, we don't know what stories they contain. Even when we know the significance, there's usually pockets we don't know. When we don't know if it's significant, then you're working with a truly blank slate. And I really think we need to find a way to recover the who, what, uh, where, when, why, and how for these sites. We need to actually incorporate a maybe a bonus sign or a plus sign or some other check mark to say, this is a site that we don't yet know anything about and we should put some emphasis toward sites that we have not yet explored. And second is the social value. Well, by social, it also includes community, spiritual, you name it, this kind of values. The local value, the significance of resources to local communities has got to be, uh, has got to be a, of importance. The local significance, I mean, that, that's kind of what first initially shores up a site. So if it's not on their radar, if it's not significant to them, you've got a whole other uh, uphill battle of motivation to try and rally around some of these sites at risk. But I think it's also important to think about the, the aspects of knowledge creation um, and knowledge sharing and also the social dynamics, social value and the ways in which community um, resilience and community understanding can be built. I really think that the community um, and their ability to mobilize and do the recording and, and interpret it is, is really key. I think it would be a big mistake to leave out the community. I think you'd find yourself in a hundred years with sites that don't matter to people. But if you're going to engage people and engage certainly the youngsters on the island, you've got to have a lot of discussion and um, good opportunities for people to be involved. That the information is shared, artifacts are, are held within the community museums. And a certain one is economic values. And some of the sites can actually be used to create some, um, how to say, economic benefits. There are businesses here who, who run on, on being holiday making businesses. So yes, having um, an economic attraction that is to do with archaeology coming here for holiday could also be good. And it brings people to the island and helps with economy because the archaeologists come and stay and eat and shop and... <laughs> Not probably wanting it to be enormous sites which attract um, cruise ships and, and would destroy the environment, but on the other hand, uh, involving people with, with what's here could, could be good. Some of the opinions from local people was that um, it's almost an expert's position to be prioritising these sites. Yes, need the expert, so then we can do it. Or we'll just go in with picking a spade and dig it up. And... In an ideal world, then we would like to see 
that we get regular visits from archaeologists. We need expertise and we need people from outside to help us and I think collaboration is, is key here. I think the, the emphasis should come from the local community and then they should get all the necessary people round the table um, to talk about what the best approach would be. Oh well that's up to the experts, I don't know enough about archaeology to gain what to do with that. What I've seen over the last 10 days is really that's how we can start some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. This is how we start to frame some of those discussions and get towards some of those decisions. So I've been so grateful for the chance to have those discussions, watch them happen, meet a lot of the people, and I'll be taking those stories back with me to the U.S.